Basically, you look at the reports, it's all force against force. Would the outcome have been different if uh, commercial professional negotiators are being sent in? The other one is uh, just a comment again. Uh, I think in the audience here, there are a lot of responsible employers. I think we should make it a point that uh, whenever employers send their staff overseas for official duties, uh, there should have been some programs uh, to make sure that they are safe or at least some briefing to ensure their safety. Thanks. Um, I think with regards to your first point about uh, whether perhaps certain tactical options should be taken, um, that's really depending on what happens on the ground. As far as we know, um, there, there wasn't a real interest in negotiating. So I think the question is moot whether we could have brought in uh, negotiators or um, try to um, approach it from a different way um, from the Mumbai authorities' point of view. So I think but um, from the Singapore perspective, we look at each issue, uh, taking cognizance of which uh, what, what happens on the ground. We sense what uh, is prevalent uh, conditions that, and what are the salient uh, issues that we must address. For example, it's, it's one where a person is obviously has no interest in uh, negotiating and just wants to kill as many people as possible. Obviously, we have to respond quickly. If one where there is a issue that uh, the person wants to talk, then we will definitely talk to the, the perpetrator and continue the engagement from there. So, these are tactical issues which also translate into the various organizations when you deal with a novel situation. You obviously must make sense of what's happening based on what uh, information you can get. Bear in mind, uh, it may not be perfect information and comes in um, various uh, degree of clarity. Um, and then from there, you have to uh, obviously decide on course of action and decide uh, what's the best way forward. So those are, are the issues which I think confront uh, the, uh, agencies. And I think in uh, dealing with the Mumbai uh, situation where obviously you see many small teams out there and some, um, and what they did was they even deliberately uh, put uh, uh, improvised explosive devices in taxis um, so that uh, when the taxis go away uh, further after a certain point of time, the explosive will explode and it will cause even more panic and um, the, create uh, this sense that there may be more attackers out there. So these are the things that people will try and do to confuse you, to confuse us on the ground. And I think that's where, again, um, having the support of the community in both understanding what's happening in various parts of uh, the area and reporting those quickly to the authorities would enable us to make uh, uh, quick uh, cognizance of what's happening so that our response can be uh, most targeted. So I think uh, that would be uh, how we would uh, look at uh, the, the responses to your questions. Um, any comments from my... In the case of Mumbai, the negotiator paradigm did not apply because the attackers fully intended to die. Uh, but certainly, it is always important for us to profile and understand whether the terrorist team that did the attack is willing to negotiate. If that is so, we should use negotiators. But in this case, as you, you have seen in the phone uh, transcript, the intention of the terrorist and their handlers was that the terrorist teams inflicted maximum damage and destruction. So we had to use a, a different method to deal with that group of terrorists. I also want to tell you that the, the units that would, the military or the police, law enforcement elite units or the quick reaction teams that would respond to a group of attackers like this they will certainly have a, a, a lethal response. It, it will be a, one of direct action, meaning to kill, uh, because you have to neutralize the threat. But I want to also share with you a little bit on the mind of these uh, no-return attackers. Basically, these attackers, they believe in five things. They believe, number one, is that 
if they are killed that they will go to paradise number 2 is they believe that they will have a direct audience with god and number 3 is that they will be forgiven for their sins and vices and number 4 that they can take 70 of their relatives to heaven that is called shafan 70 relatives to heaven and number 5 is something that all of you know that is you're going to have 72 virgins but i want to share with you that this is not written in the quran this is an invention of al qaeda so but al qaeda has been able to exploit modern communication in an unprecedented way and indoctrinate not only al qaeda members but members of different terrorist organizations that in the event they died or they were killed that they would go to heaven so in many ways death it is a part of their mission so that is why we need to train our security forces our quick response units in the most effective manner and also work very closely with the community and with the with the business sector because the scale of threat that we are facing today is different from the previous generation of terrorist groups so it requires greater cooperation and coordination even collaboration with the community and with the with the business sector with regard to the second question talking about how could the authority as in terms of Singapore police force able to uh, help especially in the area of uh, as the company sending their staff over sea I will look at it in two folds from the business continuity perspective and I will leave probably the authority questions later to be answered uh, whether there is something to be uh, how to deal with. From the business continuity perspective, we always want to profile making sure that our employee, uh, knowing where they are going, what kind of risk they are, uh, what kind of risk the country actually are uh, facing where are they supposed to go and making sure that they have a business continuity plan it's just like a very simple question in a perspective of your CEO being kidnapped how are you going to deal with it it's not just talking about just a perspective of um, the area of terrorism but it's also talking about area of um, different kind of risk that uh, your, your CEO being uh, robbed or whatever it's really very much in the area of personal responsibility as well as business continuity planning and risk uh, aversions we, we need to assess all that in the perspective of corporate responsibility as well as personal responsibility it will be very difficult to just uh, rely on the police just in that perspective and say that uh, high authority take care of me I would think that is a bit uh, difficult to go beyond that, 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 that line but however, we need the authority to do take care of us uh, when come to a point where getting some information and in the perspective of, let's say if you are caught in that situation, how to work across country uh, with embassy talking to each, each other and how to how to how let's say to solve the problems you have been kidnapped, how to resolve the problem with overseas authority. I think that is really come to a point of country to country uh, understanding how to they engage with each other. Uh, just coming on two points on May, and one is overarching both questions. But I'll just come back on the um, question about travel. The, we do have a corporate responsibility as well as a personal responsibility, but it's actually thinking about it. You can get all the data in from various sources, some of it government sources, some of it agencies that provide it, but it's actually what you do to interpret it that's the key. You know, I had a colleague coming into the south of India just two days after the Mumbai and had to go through Mumbai Airport. Now the easy thing would have been to say, no, you can't go. The difficult thing is to say, well, yes, you can go if you want to go. And, and actually, I don't mind you going through the airport and just if you're changing planes for two hours. So, and then I think you have to give that individual, whether they're on a long-term attachment or passing through, 24 by 7 connectivity. You've got to give them that, that lifeline of support from the agency within your organization that is there to provide it 24 by so if they feel uncomfortable 
you're there to help them, albeit by way of telephone communication. And going back to the point about, I very much agree with the Professor on the, the negotiator subject, and we must never give up the opportunity to negotiate a peaceful solution, but that's not an easy tactic when you're dealing with this type of terrorism, but we must never miss it. But if we look at gathering information and look at what's happened historically, if you can extend Guardian beyond the security industry in some way into your other amenities and utility services and get those eyes and ears looking for unusual behaviour, and if we think about the bomb factory in Leeds, which actually made the 77 bombers equipment, history will tell us that there were unusual circumstances surrounding that location which people observed. When we look at the radicalisation of individuals into this culture, which the professor just so rightly said is not in the Koran, it's devised for their purpose, people have actually seen these people changing and don't know where to go to say what they've seen. So we've got to create a vehicle to gather that information. Guardian is the first step. But the next step beyond that is, I say it about in the United Kingdom, and I don't know if you have it in Singapore, Paul, but the post men and women know more about your life than you know yourself. Yeah? They know when they're delivering the estate agent houses documents that you're thinking of moving home. They know when you get an abundance of solicitors' letters, there's something funny going on. And when you get a red bill, they know you're in debt. So the post men and women this simple basic function of our life actually hold a plethora of information that can assist us when something unusual happens. The trick is how do we engage them without a big brother attitude from the politicians and the press? How do we not let it be seen or criticised as a failure of law enforcement and the public doing the policeman's job? How does one overcome those challenges? But the knowledge and the awareness is out there the trick is to harness it and find the vehicles for flow. So I just felt that, that may be a benefit to you.